everyone. Welcome to today's edition of One Single Story. It is Christmas Day, Sunday, December 25th, and I hope that um, sometime today you will have had time to worship together with your family, uh, gather with your family, spend some time with your family. And uh, as we have done for the last quarter of the year, the weekends have been a one-on-one. And today, as our weekend one-on-one guest, is our newest staff member, Chris Rexroad. And so by the time you hear this uh, or watch this, if you watch it on YouTube, I know a lot of you watch on YouTube. If you, By the time you, you, you get this podcast, he will already be in town. Um, and some of you will have already met him, but we're recording this before he's actually moved. So you're currently in Fort Wayne, right? Is I guess that's where you're at. Yeah, that is right. Yeah. So, um, Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe uh, introduce yourself to the people. This will be the first time for some folks anyway, because the holidays are busy. But tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity and Merry Christmas to everybody. Um, I I grew up here in Indiana. I come from a military family, Air Force. Um, So that's what brought my family here. The rest of my family lives in West Virginia. And uh, just grew up in a pretty small school playing soccer. Uh, really enjoyed that. And uh, then later on, I got into uh, machining, tool and die, CNC work. And I worked in the factory for um, quite a few years and then got called into ministry in my 30s and um, went and uh, worked full time and did online schooling to get a degree in ministry and then got hired here in Fort Wayne. And that's what brought my wife and I up here. Yeah. And two, two boys. Oh, yeah. Two boys. Yeah, we have two, two adult boys. One's by the time this airs, he'll be 27. And the other one is 20. And my oldest one is married and traveling with his wife, who's a, a travel nurse doctor. And my youngest one is um, in the middle of his bachelor's degree um, working on uh, for youth ministry. Okay. So, and um, by the time you get here, I guess by the time they see this, you're here in town and um, we're excited to have you. And so today we're going to look at Second Peter chapter one. So the very first 11 verses of Second Peter, and I'll re- read a few of the verses and then we'll um, kind of talk about it. It says, This letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need to live a godly life. We have received all this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous grace. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So, he gives them a greeting here, you know, in the faith. It's pretty common for Paul's writings, uh, epistles especially. And um, and he, he talks about may you have grace and peace to grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. So he kind of leads out that this is going to be about spiritual growth. You know, I'm going to write to you about some some ways or some things that you need to grow. And he says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need to live a godly life. So the conversation, how I would like to start out is, do we currently have everything we need to live a godly life? Or do we obtain more um, as we go along the journey? I've always kind of viewed it as as both, that God has provided us everything that we need at this stage of our in our life, both for the the earthly and for the spiritual. And as we continue to grow in our knowledge and understanding of him, he continues to provide more and more for us down the road as we we grow in our faith and our, our understanding in him. And and how would you, if somebody asks you, what is a godly life, what would you tell them? How would you define that or describe that? Uh, the simplest way is that when, when people see and they interact with you, 
would they describe that as being Christ-like? But would this person, when you see and talk to them, are they what you would think a Christian would be or what we're called to be? Um, it, it would be a, a life of, of discipline, um, but joy in it, not doing it as a, as a duty, but because you want to live that way because you're in such awe of God and appreciation of Jesus. And, you know, in this, in this verse, he talks about the life you have received all this by, by coming to know him. It's a, I think there is a misconception that salvation is all the coming to know him there is. So the question I would ask you is over how have you come to know him differently, better, or more in your Christian walk? Oh, well, through, through experiences and trials. I mean, uh, that's usually where I learn the most. We never want to go through those, but that's where I definitely see God show up the most. And that's, I think he allows us to go through those because he knows in those times that we really focus on him. And I was just talking to a group of adults not too long ago that it's it's kind of ironic that when we have mountaintop experiences that we have a tendency of of slipping there because we uh, we can kind of take the focus off of how much we need him. A lot of times we're just so grateful for what's going on and everything that we kind of get caught back up in our own world because everything's okay. But when we go through trials, we seem to to grow closer to him in a relationship because we're reminded on how much we need him. Yeah. When in that, in that mountaintop experience, you know, if you look at mountain peaks, there's a lot more surface going down and coming up than there <laughs> yeah. is, than there is at the top, you know? So um, there, 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 we spend most of our time, or at least I do, let me put it that way. I spend most of my time either going up, or coming down. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have moments, that's the way it feels, moments that it feels like everything is perfect, you know, um, but it, I, I heard John Maxwell say recently, he said, a leader doesn't have two good days back to back. <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, you know, there's some truth into that, even in the Christian faith that you're going to have moments where everything feels perfect, but there's going to be a lot of moments where the client is climb. You're climbing up, or you're rolling down. You know, sometimes at a, a pretty rapid speed. Um, are there any tools or resources that you use, or you think are important in a person's walk that they can be a part of, practice, do to to know Christ better? Ooh, um, definitely um, act of faith, uh, even if you're a beginning Christian or if you've been a Christian for five years or 20 years, continuing to grow in your knowledge of him, but then actually going out and applying it um, at each stage of our walk with Christ, we can become more and more of, a, of an asset to people around us, not just because of knowledge, but because of application of going and serving people. And then maybe as you grow in that area there and you're growing in your knowledge, you can then become some form of a teacher or a mentor to somebody um, that could be somebody at work that's not a Christian, um, that you're displaying actions of, of love and faith to them. Um, or it could be a matter of leading a, a small group or being a part of a, a ministry that connects with the community. Yeah, good. Verse four there says, um, because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. I, I'm curious, what promises do you think he's talking about and are they just current promises or are some of them to still to come? I, I would say both, um, both current promises and the ones to come. Um, the biggest one is going to be our trust and the promise that he's given to us that by us choosing to follow him and submitting our life to him, that we will be resurrected um, on our last day. Um, and that's something that comes in the future, but because he has said it and he's God, he's true, he's holy, it's as good as done. That right. would be the biggest promise that I lean on. Right. And and that is a promise to come. The, how, do, how do we take on his divine nature now? 
Hmm. Definitely by loving people. That's that's one of the biggest ones. Um, his promises now, I mean, there's there's lots of times of uncertainty that we don't really know what's going to become around the corner, whether it has to do with uh, employment or health or relationships. And he's promised to be with us through those things and supply for our needs. And I've gone through a lot of different things myself, and I have seen him come through. Sometimes you feel very disconnected, but God's actually there carrying you at that time. Right. So he proves himself to be faithful in those times when you're you're powerless. Yeah. A couple of months ago, I had a conversation. I recently shared it on Facebook with a guy and uh, he is a big real estate developer. He's a believer, um, Mm -hmm. but he's in a, a large metropolitan city. And I was asking him how the current climate was affecting his business because their business includes building 600 homes a year and they have a title insurance company, a mortgage company. You know, there's like six companies all together, but they're all in the real estate business and interest rates rising, you know, just putting the brakes on a lot of things. And we talked about it for a few minutes. And he talked about some of the challenges that he was having. But as we separated and we got a few steps apart, he turned around and said, hey, but it's the same God. And um, that is a perspective that I think we have to have in that um, in the darkest, most difficult moments here, we may not know exactly how it's going to turn out. But we, it's the same God. It's the, the same God that did things yesterday or last year or 2,000 years ago. It's the same God that's going to, it's still at work in our lives today. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, he, he goes on to say, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. Self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. Um, so two two pieces to this that I want to ask you about. One, why are these things a response to God's promises? Why are we to do these? God gave us these promises and our response should be these things. And the second part of the question is, is this an order? You know, so he talks about more excellence and then adding knowledge. And then after you have knowledge with self-control, is that the order that you go in? Or do you think people um, get some of these quicker than other ones? Um, so yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, well, to answer your first question, it it definitely makes us more Christ-like. It takes our hearts and puts it into where we're caring about other people, um, not think, you know, with humility um, and um, yeah, just with humility. I mean, you're not thinking of you're not thinking less of yourself, but you're thinking about yourself less. You're you're putting other people in front of you and you're caring for them. Um, so a lot of this right here to me seems like it's pointing us in the direction of becoming more Christ like becoming the people that he originally intended us to be which because of the curse and because of our selfishness at times can be can be an opposition to what he wants us to actually be. Um, the order of it, um, I think it, it creates kind of a natural progression generally for people, but I don't think that um, it has to be done in this particular order because we're all we're all different. There's certain things in here that are going to come a little bit more natural uh, to me than somebody else and certain things that I have to work on continuously to kind of stay on top of. And I think that each one of them builds onto the other one along the way, instead of just trying to um, just be self-controlled all the time and then not work on patience or, um, you know, brotherly affection um, is, is not healthy. It creates a major imbalance, but I think that they all do play into each other. Right. I, yeah, I would say there probably is not a specific order, but I, I think the, kind of the tone that he's setting, and we'll we'll get to this in just a second, is there's a direction. You at least need to be going in a direction um, that looks more and more like Jesus every day. Mm-hmm. And there are times, we've even had this conversation in leadership here before, that, 
you would have two people who were struggling with the same issue, but I didn't, we didn't approach them the same way because one in other places in their life, were looking more and more like Jesus while the other was, this was a clear regression in their walk with Christ, you know, same action, just different people doing the same thing. And, um, you know, there are things that I think are expected of me that, that if I did, people would go, whoa, he sh- that that's not cool. But if somebody else did it, it would be okay because there's a higher expectation of me. They expect me to be further along the road than than some other people are. Yeah. Um, verse eight says, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who did fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. Um, he talks about growing. How How do people grow spiritually? What are some practical things people can do? to grow spiritually? Oh, um, well, definitely getting into the word and reading it for yourself and studying it, but also being connected with other people that can help pour into you, whether it's through a Bible study class, a small group, um, also being involved in church on a regular basis. I mean, we, we go to church because we're able to go and worship together and spend time together and collect as a family, but we also go there to to glean understanding and information from those that God has put there for them to to lead us and teach us, and then to go and actually apply what we're learning. And like I said before, we're all at different steps in our faith, but each one of us can go and uh, take our faith and put it into action. Yeah, so he says, but those who fail to develop in that way are short-sighted and blind. What causes people not to to grow? I mean, what are what are some reasons why you think people stop growing? Mm. Um one big one is is comfort. Um people are comfortable where they're at and sometimes growing is going to not sometimes most times growing is going to take you out of your comfort zone. Um, that would be one. Um, another one might be that they they might not have been raised in a way where they um, understand the value of what God's calling us to do. And they're just now beginning to grow. Um, pride can kind of play into that as well, where somebody thinks that they don't need to continue to develop and grow and exercise their faith. Um and sometimes there's things that just come along where, you know, like it feels like life has pulled the rug out from underneath of us and we just kind of sit there kind of stuck in a spot where we're just kind of like not knowing exactly what it is we're supposed to do and why this is going on. Yeah. And, I, you know, it's tough to watch people get stuck. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter whether they're in their career or in their spiritual life personal life, married life, you know, when they hit that, it's almost like they hit a wall and, and um, they begin to take spiritual things for granted, their spouse for granted, their family for granted, you know, it causes us to, uh, and and there is the thing that I, I notice is that there is a, an, a very immediate receding. It's not like you get to a point and you stop and, you know, you stay there, you begin to recede if you don't, if you're not growing, you're going backwards. There's no neutral in spiritual growth. At least that's the way I would, I would put it. Um, yeah. uh, verse verse ten though says, "So dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things, and you will never fall fall away." This is this is a um, cultural tension. Um, that I don't have to prove anything to you. You know, I, 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 Jesus saved me and you just have to accept it. But Peter here is, and I think I said at the beginning of this, I said, used Paul's name, but Peter here is, this is Peter's writing. I think it's where we're at today. Peter's writing mm-hmm. is, um, Peter says we should prove 
mm-hmm. that we're a follower of Christ? Why should we be concerned about proving we're a follower of Christ? Oh, yeah. Just, I mean, people, I mean, we can, I've used this phrase before and I can't remember who I got it from, but 90% of evangelism is nonverbal. I mean, when people will actually believe what we're saying, if they see us doing it and most non-Christians know what Christians are supposed to be doing, um, not just being quote unquote Christian, but what it actually means to follow Jesus. Right. And it's not just, you know, there are, we can have debates about what it means to love somebody, Mm -hmm. but it's simple things like being honorable and honest and, you know, doing what we said we were going to do. And um, those are things that non-Christians expect and that we can't say we're a Christian enough times to overcome bad actions. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter how many times you say I'm saved. If your actions betray you, they're not going to believe you. And it is. and, And then when we do make mistakes, we're often not very honest about it. You know, we don't come clean and say, you know what? Yeah, I didn't quite, quite get that right. You know, I'm sorry. Uh, we we defend ourselves and become self-righteous or try to point out their flaws, which we believe are worse than ours. And uh, yeah. so um, I do think it's important that we not fall into that trap, that we don't have anything to prove to anybody we do. I think it's important for people to see us live the life. Um, I, go ahead. I think people understand the value of what Jesus actually did, and an easy refresher for any of us is to go back and watch the Passion of Christ uh, movie. I mean, if, if we understand exactly what he did for us, we would want, every part of us should want to move forward in following him in obedience and being a part of the ministry that he's allowing us to be in, um, whether it's in church or whether it's in the community or your work or your home. Um, that he's actually calling us to exercise those things. Yeah. And people should see that developing in us. They should every day. Uh, so the last verse here says, then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. Um, this is an interesting way to put it, a grand entrance into the kingdom. Um are there benefits or are there rewards for living a righteous life? Not being saved, completely different concept, like living uprightly and being saved are not this, not necessarily the same. Um, so are there rewards for living a righteous life? Uh, in here or in heaven? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The yeah. answer is yes. Both. Yeah, there there are both. Um, okay. Here in this world, um, the rewards for living a righteous life are God doesn't reward us as human beings would consider a reward. Uh, we see people that are incredibly rich, but they um, have no real authentic friends or um, they're kind of miserable in their life, not saying all are. And I've seen some people that barely have anything, uh, several trips to Haiti. There's kids down there that you just, you, they're, they're kicking around a paper ball instead of a soccer ball and they're just loving life, you know? So the rewards that we get oftentimes are, um, you know, God responding to our prayers of when we're in times of need, whether it's sickness or guidance, um, just uh, with everything else we talked about, I think um, a huge blessing that we get is as we grow and learn in contentment, as Paul talked about um, before we were talking, you you made mention about the mountaintop analogies. Um, I think it's when we go through those things, we really learn contentment because we know that God's going to be with us. Um, but in heaven, uh, it does talk about uh, different kinds of crowns um, that we will receive and then that we'll lay down uh, to Christ himself. But I, I, yeah, I believe that there are rewards, but the ultimate reward is is Jesus. Yeah, I would agree with that. Is there anything in these verses that we didn't cover you wanted to make sure we talked about before we wind this down? I don't think so. This is this has been fun. I like this. Yeah, good. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, let's close in prayer today. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you today uh, for the opportunity to talk with Chris about this passage in Peter and how it 
challenges us to continually grow in our faith, to to become more and more like Christ, to add daily to our lives the things that resemble him. And I pray, God, that we would be intentional in our spiritual growth, to connect with other people, to read our Bible on a daily basis, to be a part of groups where we are challenged and and can grow together. God, work in our lives, speak in our lives, help us daily to become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 